Hello, good afternoon. It is the 2nd of September 2020 and I read this morning chapter 2 of uh, chapter 6, the second part of a book entitled Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth and it was written by Stuart Holroyd and it was published in 1977 and I've been uploading on my YouTube the subsequent, uh, the previous channels. The chapters are very long and the sentences are long and sometimes convoluted and the subject matter is not easy to comprehend. So therefore, this is now part three of chapter six, which is entitled Ambassadors Extraordinary. And it ended with Phyllis asking questions of Tom speaks for the council and they learned that they in a previous life had lived together in the same space-time reality and it had been in the time of the Crusades and uh, Phyllis ended saying well that's what they're going to try to do this time it now goes on Tom later confirmed that her interpretation was basically right there had been a building a building up of terrorist infiltration in the city of Jerusalem over the past three months. This is 1974. They were armed by supplies that originated from a munitions factory in a small Russian town named North Bravna. The eagle that watched and would not intervene was the United States. They are interpreting a dream. The outbreak of terrorist activity was imminent and they should project their energies and their, and their concentration over the next days to the city of Jerusalem. Should we physically go there, John said. We can easily do so. Tom had to consult before he could answer. There's danger, he said. You will be protected, but we cannot make that decision for you. Of course they went. They spent the greater part of two days wandering about the narrow alleys and visiting the holy cities of the old city of Jerusalem. This walled city within a city, this bustling relic of many pasts thriving in the present, fascinated Phyllis. She soon learned how to haggle and joke with the Arab traders, which embarrassed John, though he had to admit that she was playing the tourist pretty convincingly. Several times they lost her and had to retrace their steps up a thronged alley, looking into every shop as they went until they found her. Bargaining with a trader over an embroidered calabir, calabir or a piece of jewellery or an ornament. It was quite credible that some of the traders or some of the young Arabs lounging about or sitting drinking coffee should be the terrorists infiltrators that Tom had spoken about. There were plenty of heavily armed Israeli soldiers around, too. Some casually patrolling the alleys and others posted on roofs and surveying the scene below. It wasn't difficult to imagine violence suddenly erupting and the panic that would ensue in the narrow streets of its shoot if shooting started. Accompanying them on this trip was Leon Berg, a friend of John's from England. Leon had been one of the helpers at the time of the May lectures, but John hadn't seen much of him since that time. He had gone to Tel Aviv on an impulse. He knew that John was there, but assumed that he was on business and knew nothing about the work or his involvement with Andrija and Phyllis. He had contacted him at the Sheraton when he arrived in Tel Aviv, and he joined them on several of their trips over the next couple of weeks, though he still had little idea of what they were engaged on. I have to bring Leon Burke into this story at this point because he was because of him. It was because of him that they went to Ain Kerem, A Ain Kerem, E E I E I N K K E R E M. Ain Kerem is a village just outside Jerusalem. Leon said he had some friends who lived there and would like to take the opportunity to pray to pay them a visit. He had been told. That they lived near the church so when they reached Ein Kerem, John drove up a lane which warmed up towards the church but only to find that it terminated in a cul-de-sac. 
Then an extra no uh, extraordinary thing happened. When John tried to reverse back to find a place to turn, the car simply wouldn't move. All four wheels were locked. He tried everything he knew to release them, but to no avail. The car was obstructing the lane, but the only way they could move to could move it was by sliding it downhill. This they did with some help, and the car nearly veered into a wall. Nearly veered into a wall as they negotiated a bend. Eventually they got to the bottom of the hill where the road was wider, and John tried again to release the locked brake. It was a hydraulic system, and in spite of his long motoring experience, John couldn't imagine how all four wheels could remain locked in this way. Leon went on foot to try to find his friends, hoping that they might be able to help, at least by recommending a local mechanic. The car would stop just outside the big church, when, which Phyllis said they should go into. She was quite insistent about it, so John and Andretta complied, as they always did when she got strong impulses to do something, knowing, them, knowing from experience that the thought wasn't always her own. The church was locked, but soon after they tried the door, it was opened from within by a priest. The church seemed ordinary enough, and after wandering around it for some time, they were about to leave when the priest called them back and led them to a corner of the church that they had missed, where a short flight of steps led down into an illuminated grotto. Here, they learned, was the spot where John the Baptist had lived. That was interesting. They spent some time reading the text and looking at the pictures on the wall of the cave, then left the church and returned to the car. John could never explain why, but he knew with absolute certainty before he stepped into the car that the mysterious vault would be rectified. And he was right. After a couple of minutes, Leon reappeared, still having failed to find his friends, and they drove back to Jerusalem without further trouble. We had occasions before to wonder whether the intelligence that is Tom is a clever opportunist, ingenious in thinking up explanations for events that fit them into their own scheme of things. With regard to this incident, he admitted to being an opportunist, but in a rather different sense. He claimed that the management had seized the opportunity of Andreja being in Ein Kerem to make a point. Tom said, it was Altia using the energy of the being. It was on our direction, he said when Andreja asked for an explanation of the incident. Andreja said, and why did you have us stop right there? Tom answered, you are the proclaimer. John the Baptist, of course, proclaimed the opening of Christ, the coming of Christ. Here, clearly, was appointed to Andreja's role in the present-day situation. Tom spelt it out quite unambiguously. You are the proclaimer, and it is now the beginning. And Richard asked, what specifically is to be proclaimed at this time? He half expected to be reproached by Tom for asking something he already knew, but Tom didn't mention the landing, as he had anticipated, but said, It is important for you to have those of the nation of Israel understand from where they came and for what purpose. Both Andrija and John understood the allusion. In earlier communications, they had learned that the Israelis were descendants of the extraterrestrial civilization of Thuva, whose leader was Jehovah. They were what Tom termed a species nation. A species, he had explained, was a hybrid. All beings on this planet have lived on other planets, but there are those that are a mixture. Physical beings may be reborn on another planet. A species is a mixture of two or more planets at the time of its physical existence. It has a strong ego, and it has free will. The Israelites were not the only hybrid people on the planet, Tom said, but as they were the descendants of Hoover, the extraterrestrial civilization that had special responsibility and concern for the development of the planet Earth, 
They had a particular important role to play in history. That was the gist of the message that Anveja, as the proclaimer, was supposed to convey to the people of Israel. As it is one of the major themes of the communications from now on, and allegedly one of the most important things to get mankind to understand, I will discuss to summarize the whole story and message as it emerged through a number of communications held over a period. By the way of introduction, I would like to quote part of a communication which I recently participated in, being Stuart Holwright. When I was able to put a question and a point of view, which I'm sure many readers would want to put at this stage. This was in May 1976, when I paid a visit to Israel and this particular conversation took place in a trance session with Phyllis in the Neptune Hotel in Eliab. Eliab. After spending Eliab. After spending nearly two weeks in Israel, I had formed the impression that its people were efficient, aggressive, sensual, hidebound, and quite unspiritual. And I couldn't reconcile this with what at that time I knew about their alleged role and history. So I put my problem and point of view to Tom. As the aim of your program, as I understand it, is to heighten consciousness on this planet and to unite the people of this planet, I find it very difficult to come to terms with the fact that the Israeli people are the chosen people for this work. It would seem that in this time the idea of a chosen people is a rather retrograde concept and that if it has any meaning it is not racial but applies to people from all over the world and free from and from different cultures. Tom asked, Do you understand that in the nation of Israel there are represented all the nations of this planet Earth? I said I realized that and he continued, Do you understand that when we use the term chosen, it is not necessary to relate to them that they are chosen, but what we are trying to say is that if they had followed their program, we would not be in the situation we are in now, for all the nations on the planet would be chosen. All the nations on the planet Earth would be chosen. In this nation of Israel, they are, there are representatives of each of the nations on the planet. And if you reach this nation, its energy will generate then to all of the other nations. And what should have been thousands of years ago will then come into being. It is not that they are chosen and specialness, for what they have chosen and been chosen for is similar to service. It must be understood that being chosen is not necessarily to be elite, for being chosen brings great difficulty. I said yes, I understand that, but my problem is that the Israelis, as I see them today, must be one of the most difficult people in the world to bring around to higher consciousness. I feel, though, that the higher consciousness is being generated by a large number of people scattered throughout the world and that mankind's greatest hope lies with these people rather than with any special group. Tom said, we understand what you are saying. But if you imagine the universe as a whole and you see the planet Earth as a black spot in the universe which has bottlenecked the evolution of the universe and stopped the growth of the souls that should by this time have evolved further than they have, and if you then look upon the Earth as the universe and see the nation of Israel as the black spot of the planet Earth, you will then understand that it is important to reach the nation that has all nations within it in order to raise the level of all the nations. Ooh, ooh. That was a, a big sentence, huh? Um, sorry. To raise the planet of all nations. 
raise the consciousness of all nations. The logic may be difficult to follow if you are not au fait with the view, which is central to Tom's philosophy, that events in the microcosm affect the macrocosm, and vice versa. But the answer does quite ingeniously dispose of the suspicion that the management are a kind of cosmic Zoninist faction, which must be the invention. This must be the invention. What the hell? Uh, must be the. <laughs> After 30 days, no, no, no. Sorry, I like a bit of music in the background, so you just have to put up with it for a minute. I apologize. Okay, here we go. The logic may be difficult to follow if you are not of faith with a view which is central to Tom's philosophy that events in the microcosm affect the macrocosm and vice versa. But the answer does quite ingeniously dispose of the suspicion that the management are a kind of cosmic Zionist faction, which must be the invention of some fanatic Zionist brain on Earth. In the following paragraphs, I will attempt to summarize the story of the history and role of the Jews using the, funda using the framework of known biblical history to supplement and elucidate the, the information volunteered by Tom over a period of time. The land of Mesopotamia, which historians regard as the cradle of civilization, was peopled by one of the groups that migrated from the nuclear civilization of Aksu. About 2000 BC, the space civilization of Hoover launched another attempt to upgrade the planet Earth and shows as the most promising group to work through the tribe living in Mesopotamia. It was Abraham of Ur who initiated the experiment, the aim of which was to produce an improved stock of human beings who would lead the planet into its next evolutionary stage. The improvement was to be accomplished by engineering into the genetic codes the essence of Hoover in order to produce a new hybrid species on Earth. The children of Abraham were the first to be so implanted, and the plan was that they should eventually interbreed with all the nations and races of the world in order to produce a more highly evolved genetic strain, and also that they should raise human consciousness by teaching the skills and knowledge that were their heritage from Hoover. Chapter 17 of the book of Genesis records Jehovah's covenant with Abraham. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. But the plan went wrong because the Jews forgot their role and their cosmic origins and became an inbred ethnic group, forced in upon themselves by struggles for survival in harsh physical conditions and by the enmity and resentment of other people who did not understand them. Hoover had to intervene again to attempt to bring it and grotesque people back to an understanding of their role and mission in the 13th century BC when Jehovah appeared to Mo as Moses. He led the Jewish people out of bondage and gave them the law that was to become the basis of their religion. The purpose of the law was to inculcate principle, was to inculcate principle and self-discipline in the people. The 40 years they spent wandering in the wilderness was a time of trial for the Jewish people, a test of their faith and their obedience. And though on occasion they denied God and rebelled against Moses' leadership, the generation that eventually inherited the promised land was a generation that had never known bondage and in whom a life of hardship had cultivated discipline and principle and its consummation had strengthened their faith in God. There followed a time of internal keen struggles and an attempt to build the earthly kingdom and again the Jews made the error of forgetting their origins and their purpose. They isolated themselves from the world, they deified a Moses and trivialized the law by elaborating it into a code of religious observances. They enjoyed independence and sovereignty for a time but they did not fulfill their intended function and when this period ended with the Roman conquest, 
Puva took advantage of the conditions of social and spiritual upheaval and Jehovah incarnated again as Jesus of Nazareth, coming amongst his people as an example and a model of a man's next phase of evolution. As Moses, he had brought the principle of law, and as Jesus, he brought the principle of love and kindness in order to guide the Jewish people towards the fulfillment of their destiny. The book does not always tell the truth, said Tom, referring to the Bible when Andrecha said that as he understood it, Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion were foreordained. The truth was that if the Jews had accepted Jesus as their leader and had followed him, he would have shown them, and in turn, the rest of the planet, the way to individual and global transformation. The crucifixion was not part of the plan, nor was the religion that centered its theology upon that event, which only signified another failure on the part of the Jews to understand and fulfill their role in the process of planetary evolution. Thereafter, they lost their, hu their homeland and were dispersed about the earth. And though they contributed knowledge, invention, and beauty to the other cultures, they lived in, they lived in, they never integrated completely with their other cultures, but remained jealous of their traditions and their identity. The recreation of the state of Israel in modern times presented the first opportunity since the diaspora for the Jews to be reached collectively and reminded of their true heritage and role. It is, however, now too late for the original plan of gradual planetary evolution through their agency to be carried out, and Hoover has adopted a new policy towards the Earth, a kind of shock strategy because of the seriousness of the situation in which a period of preparation will be followed by a landing on Earth. The process of preparation will not this time involve sending a special individual whom humanity might deify, but the appearance of a number of individuals endowed with the powers of Hoover, of whom Yuri Geller was one, and at the same time the work of trying to develop planetary and cosmic consciousness in the people of Israel will continue. If only because of all the people's Earth's peoples, they are the most intractable, and if they can be raised and made aware of their cosmic connection, there is hope for the rest of the world. To return to the communication that took place after the visit to the church at Ein Karen, You didn't have to lead me to the grotto of St. John the Baptist, and Richard told Tom. I mean, as a proclaimer, I didn't need to know of that particular place. But now the subject has been raised. Can you tell me more about the strange tale of how St. John's life ended. Is it true that Herod's daughter requested his head to be cut off? It was not Herod's daughter, it was his stepdaughter. And did she indeed order his head? She was a child. She, not, she did it for her mother, for John spurned her. I see. You mean that Herod's wife tried to lay St. John? Tom said, we understand not that term. And Recha explained and he, informed, he confirmed that this was in fact what had happened. <laughs> Herod's wife tried to lay St. John. <laughs> that happened and took the opportunity to give Andreja a bit of advice. You must be careful of your she people who use the wiles of a she. You must be careful of your she people who use the wiles of a, of a she. You will not be beheaded, doctor, but if you are not careful, your personal life could interfere with your knowledge of truth, and that would be like a beheading. And Richard brought the conversation back to an earlier point. When one proclaims, one usually pro proclaims on the basis of knowledge, and that knowledge has a source. Tom didn't let him complete the sentence, he interrupted. John didn't have the knowledge and he proclaimed, because he knew in his heart. You speak of knowledge as written or established, but true knowledge and wisdom is in the heart. 
There followed a long discussion of the means of proclaiming, and Tom said that Andre should write another book, which would be based upon the communications and would serve as a source for material for television and film. They discussed what should go into the book, and John raised the question of the past lifetimes material, pointing out that many mediums and other people in the past had totally discredited themselves by claiming to have been important people in other incarnations. We three are, on the face of it, very ordinary people, he said, and people are going to wonder why we have this particular information. Tom had a suggestion. May it be possible in your publication to review your own lives in this lifetime in order to make sense of your past lives? Can you show the fine line of what you have brought forward? And Ritter said, well, yes, it would be possible if we knew more of our past lives. And then we would have to decide if we could relate our present existence to the past one. But the subject doesn't really concern us from a personal or ego point of view, and it isn't our main problem. The problem is, I'll tell you frankly, that we believe that you've given us what we call a mission impossible. And when I say this, I mean that for us, who are in this world as Gentiles, to try to convince the Jewish people, the Israelites, of their true origins and their true responsibilities and of who is coming in the next few years, it seems to be almost impossible. Do you not understand that with the nine and you three working together, all things are possible? Yes, you've told us that before, but we also know that there are certain things that you don't understand about the physical, about desire and about emotion. And it is we who have to deal directly with the emotions, with the blocks, with the negativity. Do you not think that we are learning when we deal with the emotions of the three of you? Yes, Andreja conceded. We know you're learning because you tell us quite clearly things about ourselves that we aren't aware of. But then you must also recognize the un unusually stubborn, hard-headed and disbelieving nature of these Israeli people. Are you not stubborn and hard-headed? If you were not, you would not have come this far. And Sir John, he is very much of a stubborn nature and with a hard hat. And this being, Phyllis, at times we cannot reach because of the closing. Do you understand that the three of you are of the nature of those of Israel? And if you can reach each other, you can reach those of the nation of Israel. And Reda said, well, I accept that, but you have to remember that we have had your presence and guidance and even so have made many mistakes. And you will do for those that we have tried to do for you, Tom said with a note of finality. And you will do for those what we have tried to do for you, Tom said with a note of finality. They spent two days at Jerusalem on this first visit and at the end of the time we're told by Tom that they had accomplished a great deal. Because of your presence and the energy that has been utilized from the three of you, there is now greater hope and stability of emotion up among the leaders of the nation, he said, and went on to give an interesting brief analysis of the international political situation with regard to Israel. It was planned by the most powerful governments in your world that this nation would in fact be crucified. In the reasoning of the governments, it would have been justified. This has been averted at this time. But this does not mean there is complete peace. As you know, in all times of crisis, those of the notion of nation of Tuva have always taken the blame. It is because the rest of the people of the world need a reason for their emotion and it is projected on those of the nation of Hoover because of the lack of understanding. We are saddened that these people have come no further. It is true that those of the nation of Israel, because of the physical conditions of the planet Earth, have not followed the path of truth, but it is also true that those of the other nations have not done so either. In order to exonerate themselves, they will cause a 
blemish upon another, and it will throw the other into a pit of cobras. They will be ashamed at another time, but that has been the history of the planet Earth. We cannot have it so in the future, nor at this time. It is a time for each individual to stop, to respond, and to realize that it is within them that the blame lies, not within others. This was the kind of message that the three were now expected to proclaim. That the three were now expected to proclaim. But as proclaiming was a new task laid upon them, and one requiring some preparation, their activities during the rest of this stay in Israel were directed towards fulfilling their earlier instruction to travel about the country and thus help bring peace and stability to all its people. There were a number of people in Israel who knew about Andretta's work in the parasciences and how, who somehow got to know that he was in Tel Aviv and John kept answering calls from people who wanted to meet him or ask him to give a talk. Anvetja was feeling pretty exhausted with all the travelling and general refused such requests. But one invitation that they had accepted because it happened to fall in with their itinerary that led to interesting developments. It came from a Mrs. Judith Stahl who lived in Amirim, a village in the hills of Galilee, which was well known throughout Israel as the home of a vegetarian community. Mrs. Stahl herself was a dietitian and judging from her phone call, seemed to have some idea worth getting acquainted with. And as Andreja, Phyllis and John were planning a trip to Safid in Galilee the day after she phoned, they, had, they, they said they would visit her on their return journey to Tel Aviv in the late afternoon. They made an early start the next day because Andreja, who had done this trip before, wanted to take the others to and spend some time at the ancient site of Megiddo on the way to Galilee. There was something about Megiddo, he said, that drew him back and made him feel he could spend hours there. The site of settlements going back, according to the guidebook, to about 6,000 years BC. Megiddo is a mound of fairly modest height and dimensions, which commands a view over the largest and most fertile plains of Israel. The plains that are supposed to be the physical battlefield of Armageddon, on the other side of which rise the symmetrical Mount Tabor, and beyond that, the rugged hills of Galilee. Archaeologists have cut away sections through the Mount of Megiddo, and in the deepest of these excavations is situated the old Canaanite altar, a circular platform of rough stones. This was the particular spot that Andretta said he felt drawn back to. There were hawks nesting in the rock face flanking the altar, and Hawks had a particular significance for Andreja. They stopped to meditate for 10 minutes in this spot before continuing their journey. Galilee, John thought, could have been a Swiss or South German lake, but for the names familiar since the scripture lessons of childhood, Tiberias, Migdal, Capernaum, there was an east wind and the lake was green and choppy. The other side where the Golan Heights rose San Kaledin, streaked with grief, looked uninhabited. After driving along the lakeside and visiting the sites, they completed the journey to Safid, the hill town, ancient center for the Kabbalists, that from Galileo stood out conspicuously among all the other hills, crowned with a forest of tall trees. In Safid, they spent some time walking through the narrow streets and up to the park, and they admired the view of the sun setting over the hills to the west. It was nearly dark when they arrived at Amirim and found the home of Mrs. Stahl, who turned out to be a woman aged about 45, deeply tanned and bursting with energy. She was a woman of the commanding, insistent type, and her chief concern was to get Andreja to the research to validate her findings and theories about various diets. Andretja was interested in the theories, but non-committal about working on them. They had come to Amirin at a good time, said Mrs. Stahl, because today was the festival of Hanukkah, and in the evening the children of the village were presenting a special Hanukkah entertainment in the community hall, which they could certainly see, they should certainly see. 
They went and they enjoyed the entertainment despite the language barrier, for it was tuneful and zestful, and the drama was heightened by the conditions under which it took place, with soldiers standing around with Uzi guns ready. For a neighboring village had recently been attacked at night by infiltrators from Syria. One item in, this, in, in the entertainment made a particular impression on John, Phyllis and Andreja. A painted screen was brought on stage. It had twofold frame. It had a twofold frame and therefore consisted of three panels. On the lower half of each panel were painted three figures, curiously slant-eyed and unearthly looking beings. On the top half were mushrooms of the Amanita muscaria type, the sacred mushroom that Andreja had written about in his book of that title. The symbolism was so obviously apt to their situation that John, Phyllis and Andreja all registered independently while the screen stood on stage and they were waiting for the sketch to begin. It was not only the way that the nine figures were arranged in three groups of three, but also the fact that they had over their head this mushroom. For in recent communications, Tom had referred to the umbrellas they now regularly used as mushrooms. Then, as if to reinforce the already staggering impression made upon the visitors, when the sketch began, nine children danced out from behind the screen carrying umbrellas. Once again, it seemed, Synchronicity was at work, and the three could not help wondering whether their visit to this place was as accidental as it seemed. It was not until the following day that they were able to confirm with Tom that the events of their trip were not mere chance coincidence. Andretta said, It was odd to find our symbol so clearly spelled out in this remote little village in the Galilee Hills. The preparation for that must have been very long. Tom said, it was not overnight. The screen had looked about 30 years old. To minds just getting emaciated from thinking in terms of cause and effect and of linear time, the implications were mind-boggling. It was natural to assume that the village must have some special significance. And Richard said, is there any lesson to be learned from that situation in that Miriam? And from the way those children are fed and brought up, which could be applied to the new generation of young people? Tom answered, those children are of a different nature. And it would be said, it could be said that the way they have been raised has in part given them this nature. But also they are all species and all of them have within them the ability of Yuri. Did you not see that? Well, we saw that they were different, Andrija said. We didn't know how it would manifest, though. There is a difference. It is that Yuri is aggressive and has fears. But there are no fears in these children. Amrim had, Amrim, Amirim had another significance. It is a place of special importance to you, Sir John. Tom explained, because of the many times that you have existed in this area. You were there for many years of your physical lives before the time of the Nazarene. You knew this? Well, I did have a very special feeling for the place, John said, but I didn't realize that was why. On a future visit to Israel, Tom said they would go again to Amirim and spend more time there. In the same communication, they asked Tom about Megiddo and obtained an interesting response. The first settlement there was 3,000 years earlier than generally supposed in 9,228 BC to be precise. Then a migrant group had come from afar at the time of the destruction of our great anger, a phrase which will be explained later. It was a stronghold of those that were in truth, but those that opposed sought to destroy it. And Richard asked, how did Megiddo come to be associated with Armageddon? Tom, have we not explained that those that opposed 
tried to destroy the colony that was of the essence of truth. It left in the area's vibration and this was always an area of battle, both in the physical and in the spheres. And Meta said, what puzzles me is that there's only one mention of Armageddon in the Bible and that's almost a passing reference. Tom said, we did not control what men put in your Bible. Remember, there are parts of your Bible that are not in our Bible. There are parts of your Bible that are not in your Bible. In several communications over this period, Tom reiterated that they must leave Israel by the 11th December and three days before this date, and Roger mentioned in the communication session that they had not yet been able to cover the whole area of Israel in their travels and asked if they should extend their stay in order to complete the project. Tom said, Tom said that on no account should they leave later than midday on the 12th and that had already and, and that already they had accomplished enough to ensure stability in the Middle East situation for three months. But they ought to plan to return in February. This reminded Anwar of a report he had just read in the newspaper of a speech given by King Hussein of Jordan, warning that war in the Middle East could develop to planetary proportion and stressing the importance of working towards peace in the area. And Richard told Tom, parts of the statement were almost word for word what you have said to us. Did you have any direct influence on him? Tom said, we had not, you had. Have we not explained that you are here in order to stabilize the leaders and that you have a radio of a that radius of 1,500 of your miles. Yes, we understand these things, Andretta said, but I think you have to respect our modesty. It's hard for us to believe that we could have such influence. We will explain again, Tom said, in that tone of indulgent patient that was becoming familiar. When a project is important and we request you to put aside your personal life and to proceed upon the project, each of you has three of us with you. Have you not seen what has happened and has been accomplished? Have you not noticed what has happened after you have been in an area? Have you not seen that these are those of the Arab nations that are now beginning to soften and to understand this nation? Have you not seen that within some of the Arab nations they are fearful that Arafat will begin to take over and control them? They are now turning their attention to eternal problems, internal problems. Well, said Andreja, we've been a little too busy these days to keep up with all of that detail, but thanks for putting us in the picture. On their last day in Israel, 1974, on the 10th of December, they planned a trip that would take in as many as possible of the parts of the country they had not yet covered. They left Tel Aviv early and by mid-morning they were in Hebron, where they visited Abraham's tomb. They went to Bethlehem for lunch, then drove on to visit Jericho and the Dead Sea. In falling darkness they drove south, along the road coasting the Dead Sea, then cut across the Negev to Bathsheba whence they planned to cross to the Mediterranean coastal road and drive directly back to Tel Aviv. They were not long out of Bathsheba when Phyllis got one of her flashes. She said that there was something wrong with the tire on the right-hand front wheel. Tom pulled up and he and Roger and Leon, who was accompanying them again, examined the tire, but they could find no fault in it. John was a little irritated because he suspected that Phyllis had said that just to slow down his driving. With a big distance to cover, he had tended throughout the day to drive faster than Phyllis found comfortable. And she had several times made her comfort, discomfort known. 
But John had only paid cursory attention because he knew he was driving safely. Not long after they had resumed their journey after examining the tire, John carelessly hit a curbstone, and a few miles further on he felt on the steering the pull that signals a flat tire. Fortunately, he wasn't, it wasn't a burst, but only a leak due to the damage to the rim of the wheel when he had hit the curb. It was